When we started collecting the World Wide Web, we just did the same sorts of things that the search engines did. It's basically a, a, a computer that clicks on every link on every web page and, and then records its result. Then it goes and gets that web page and then adds it in and then clicks on every one of those links and then just keeps going and going and going until you get to the end. Well, it turns out there is no end. Uh, it, the web is in fact infinite. So we prioritize it to try to go and make sure we've got some pages from every website every two months that we have since 1996. Then we made it into the Wayback Machine by making it so that if you type in a URL, it shows you all of the past versions and you can surf the web as it was. We thought it would be kind of a a quirky, fun thing for people that have kind of lost their websites or something like that. But it turns out that lots and lots of people use it. It's used by about 500,000 people every day. Well, so, uh, welcome. So this is the Internet Archive. Um, we bought this building about three years ago. It was a Christian science church. And the idea was to flatten the floor and make it into a library. But exactly what a library looks like now is a little unclear. So, we start, so we're sort of adapting to the building and the building's adapting to us. Um, so this, these are uh, servers. This is about two and a half petabytes of the, um, of the Internet Archive. Uh, and they're actually the primary copy of a lot of our books, music, and video. We're about to hit 10 petabytes. On Thursday we're having our party to celebrate the 10th petabyte, the, ten, the, the likey bite that finishes our 10 petabytes. Um, but these are actually ongoing and up and running. The, the lights are attached to the hard drives, and they indicate when somebody's uploading or downloading something from the Internet Archive. Um, and uh, the red one means that it actually needs to be replaced. So it's probably running out of the mirror copy that's in another place. There are a couple problems with trying to do data preservation. Uh, most people really focus on hard drives going wrong or something like that. And uh, frankly, that just takes diligence. You have to copy things forward every three to five years. And if you ever miss a beat, you lose it. So that's a problem. But there's also trying to contextualize it. So can you read the old format? So we've had to go and translate our movies that maybe have come in in MPEG-2 or some other formats five times. And we've had to go back over all of them and redo them five times to go and keep them so that they're in use. Um, so that is an ongoing diligence, but that isn't even really the problem. The problem is in institutional failure. What happens to libraries is they burn. Um, they get burned by governments. That's not a political statement, it's just historically what happens. The Library of Congress has already burned once. So if that's what happens to libraries, let's design for it. We, if, if the Library of Alexandria had made a copy and put it in either India or China, we'd have the other works of Aristotle, the other plays of Euripides. It would be great, uh, but they didn't. And why not? A large part is ego. You sort of say, well, it's expensive. Yeah, not really. It's, it's mostly ego and sort of, if you take your crown jewels and move it someplace else, well, are you less for it? If there's multiple copies, are you less for it? And there's starting to be a generation of people that are living in this multiple copy world. Wikipedia has, basically says, go ahead, make a Wikipedia 2. Take everything that we've done and make Wikipedia 2. Um, that's bold. That's a really interesting thing. We've, we've gone and made partial copies of ourselves and put it in the new Library of Alexandria, which is a beautiful place, and also a partial copy in Amsterdam, an access for all Oz data centers there that they've donated those spaces. So the idea of putting, having large-scale archives in other political areas such that they go through uh, their different ups and downs based on uh, different uh, forces. That I think is the really the way to make a Library of Alexandria version 2 that will last for at least as many centuries and hopefully more centuries than the version 1 did. More servers. Okay, 
So this is um, so this one. These are more of our servers. These are the front end machines, um, search engines, databases, and the like. These are storage machines, but everything's made out of the same stuff over and over again, which excuse me is now becoming more common. You know, it's how the Googles and the Hotmails and the Yahoo's work. Um, but we also use this, as you notice, there's no machine room yeah. here, right? Yeah. This is an, you know, an office for the organist that was here. Um, <laughs> and you can feel sort of the breeze coming in. The, the cool air comes in, goes through the machines, comes out hot, uh -huh. goes into our furnace, which we keep off, and it pumps it back through the building. We heat the building. We use the energy twice. We think that and because we use it twice, um, we think this may be the first time a data center has been over 100% efficient. <laughs> All right. So there's no air conditioning. We use Mother Nature for that. If it's a hot day like it is, we open the window. Otherwise, we open the door and we, and we recirculate the air in the Internet Archive. Then we started collecting these books and scanning them, and we didn't want to throw them out. We love books, and it's important to hold on to them. The, the book that was scanned to become the digital version that the next generation may get is in some sense special. Welcome. My name is Robert Miller. I'm Global Director of Books for the Internet Archive, and I'm standing in our physical archive in Richmond, California home for up to 3 million books, which will be stored here for 50 to 100 years. We have high density, long-term, deep storage devices. Uh, these units that we have are hooked up with thermocouples to measure temperature and humidity. Each one holds approximately 40,000 books. So what we have here is space for approximately 3 million items. Well, there's estimates that there are 100 million books that have been published in the world. We'd like to get one copy of each. Our initial target is 10 million volumes. Why 10 million? Well, that's about the size of a Princeton University, Yale University, or the Boston Public Library. So when I open one of these storage devices up here, you'll see the boxes, the books, the pallets inside. Each one, again, holds about 40,000 items. The one I have in my hand is the British Patent Office, was deaccessioning a collection, actually throwing them out and we were fortunate enough to get a copy of these. idea of all the books of all time being able to be available to anybody no matter where you are in the world because of the storage the computing the internet technologies that can make it so that a poor kid in Kenya or a poor kid in uh, in Kansas can go and have access to the great works no matter where they are or when they were done One of the things that we say here all the time is bits in and bits out. And that is basically just an even shorter way of saying universal access to all knowledge. Well, do you go and put it into a cloud, which really means putting it in a corporate hand, some, somebody else that might turn it off at any moment, uh, like a Yahoo video that's already gone, Google video that's already gone, GeoCities that's already gone, YouTube, oh, isn't that gonna last forever? It's like, I don't think so, Flickr, eh, not even. So uh, how do you go and try to give things away in a perpetual way? Access drives preservation. So if you think of, you know, well, why don't we just go and encrypt it and put it in a vault and we'll be able to look at it in 70 years or something like that. I think that kind of a dark archive is the worst possible idea. 
I think it's keeping things in use active that, that keeps it part of the mind share, it keeps people knowing about it, liking it, caring for it. So I think that the best way to preserve things is to make things accessible. It may sound a little unobvious, but in, especially in this digital age where it's so easy to forget. If you take things away from a, for a generation, it's as if it doesn't exist. So everything we do is open source, and all the things that we do, we try to give away. Can you make it work to give everything away? And this is a real experiment, um, and it's turning out to work. We know how to get all of the information out of every book ever written. We could do it. Given enough money, we absolutely have the ability to do that right now, today. Um, recording every television program that is broadcast anywhere in the entire world, we know how to do that. We, we record 100 channels 24 hours a day right now. It's just a matter of scale and money. We can do it right now. We know how to get the music off of LPs. We know how to get uh, the videos off of DVDs. We know how to do all of these things. It's all possible right Thank you now. very much for coming tonight. The question, I think, is whether we have the will to do it. Do we, as countries, have the will to finance creating a library that actually does give universal access to all knowledge? We can do it right now. It's starting to get big, but it's on the order of total about 10 petabytes of data. So the Library of Congress, all the words in the Library of Congress are about 25 terabytes. So it's, it's not a thousand Library of Congresses, but we're starting to get there.